So far, we've been talking about ensemble learning approaches where we don't have just one small model that we're trying to train up, but we actually have a whole set of models that we're training, and then we're combining the, the results of, of those individual models. The, the methods that we've talked about so far the, have uh, afforded uh, a certain degree of uh, parallelization in that training of, say, one decision tree is handled uh, independent of training of the next tree versus the, the next tree in this in sequence. And this allows us to throw these trees out to the different cores uh, on our computer and, and they can do, uh, do their training without having the different cores uh, interact with one another. Depending upon the particular ensemble algorithm that we've uh, talked about, we've achieved some degree of statistical independence uh, between these different trees. And, and if we can't actually make that happen, it becomes really easy for us to uh, combine the outputs of the different models. So if we're talking about uh, classifiers, we're using a voting method. If we're talking about regression, we're, say, taking an average uh, across the, the outputs of the individual models. However, with the methods that we've studied so far, we don't really have any good guarantees that we've actually achieved statistical independence across our different trees. Furthermore, when we have a scenario where some parts of our feature space are really well represented, there are a lot of, a lot of samples in, in one region, but a very small number of samples in another region, what our individual models can do, because they're trying to minimize average cost over all of the predictions of, of all the training samples, they will tend to focus in on the regions of space that are really well represented. And as an artifact, uh, we, we might end up really extrapolating very poorly to these regions that are very sparsely represented. And, and this doesn't cost the models all that much because there are just a few points uh, out there, so just a few terms that uh, have high errors. So what we'd like to be able to do is solve both of these problems. We'd like to make some better guarantees about independence and we'd like to be able to handle all parts of the feature space uh, equally well. And this brings us to this uh, notion of uh, boosting. And the, the general idea is that we uh, grow the ensemble mem members not in parallel, but in sequence. So we learn one model, then another model, and then another model. And at each step, uh, the learning process for uh, one model is uh, the, the goal is to try to repair the errors that have been made uh, in the previous models. And one thing that we can get out of this is that the new models that we're uh, introducing uh, can help to solve new pieces of the problem that haven't really been covered very well. Uh, and, and in particular, uh, as we add more and more models, we can kind of build this patchwork of individual models that can capture different parts of our uh, feature space. Ada Boost is one particular implementation of uh, boosting. And in, in the prior algorithms that we've uh, talked about, really we've treated all of our training samples as being equally important with respect to the cost function. So, so if we're computing mean squared error, each point contributes potentially equally to, to that uh, MSC measure. Uh, in the general boosting idea, we can actually imagine assigning different uh, weights to each of the training samples. And, uh, and, and with, uh, with boosting, we can adjust these weights dynamically depending upon which training samples are being covered well by the current set of models. So let's look at uh, some mathematics. We're, I'm going to try and stick with the notation that we've uh, used uh, in our prior videos. So in particular, I'm going to use J to uh, index our, our data. And we're going to introduce a, this new concept of weight. So WJ is, means the weight assigned to a particular element in our data set. So this could be, our, our for example, our training set. Um, when uh, weight is equal to zero, then what this means is that we're going to ignore this training sample. 
and when WJ is positive, this this means that uh, sample J uh, contributes to the cost function some way, and in particular, uh, larger uh, WJ um, means that we're going to contribute more. So in in the regression world. We've, we've already talked about mean squared error, and our cost function for this is uh, a, uh, a sum over all of our j's, so j equals zero to m minus one, of the squared differences between the true uh, value and the uh, predicted value. And this is divided by the total number of uh, elements uh, in the training set or in the data set that we're evaluating. We can rewrite this uh, in this way. I'm just pulling over the numerator here. We can rewrite the denominator in this way. So it's again a sum over j from 0 to m minus 1 of, uh, of 1. With this sum, we're just counting up the number of ones, and the number of ones corresponds to how many training set elements that we have. So this, this little switch here seems a little bit trivial, but it's actually going to uh, make this next step uh, a little bit more clear. So, so now what I want to do is, is make use of our weights that we've talked about here. So we now we're assuming that our training samples each have their own weight. And we have a, a notion of a, a weighted uh, mean squared error. And this cost function looks very similar. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and uh, copy the whole thing here. And we'll go from there. except what I'm going to do now is add uh, one more uh, term. So there's a WJ in here. And instead of one here, I'm just going to put uh, WJ. So we're, we're still computing a, a, a mean squared error, but now each of our samples has uh, different weights. So if all of the uh, if if one w is one and another w is is uh, uh, half, then uh, then this and we only have those two. Then the sum down here is one point five, and we have uh, an error plus the other error times point uh, five. So the the first of those uh, gets to count uh, uh, twice as much as the first as the second one. Okay, so that, that's the regression story. But for, uh, for classification, and in particular with trees, uh, I, let's um, first going to write out uh, our notion of Gini impurity and uh, for individual leaves, uh, how it changes under expansion, and our notion of uh, impurity for an entire tree. We've talked about all of these already, um, but then what we're going to do is uh, switch from uh, equal weighting of all of our training samples over to a, uh, a an unequal weighting as defined by our WJs. Okay, so first a, a few definitions here. Uh, K here, uh, lowercase k is our index for class. Uh, L is our index for a leaf node. And in particular, sometimes it's convenient to be able to say, give me all of the elements in a data set that are in that are members of a set uh, L 
uh, big L sub little L here. What this means is uh, all uh, data set uh, elements that uh, have fallen into uh, uh, leaf uh, uh, little L. Okay, so uh, it's and, and a few more definitions here. Uh, we have a notion of NL, and that's actually equal to, uh, I'm gonna write this for the mathematicians. So if, if big L sub little L is a set, um, then the size of that set uh, is NL, and this is the uh, number of uh, data set elements in, that have fallen into leaf L. And it's all also useful to be able to talk about the number of leaf elements in leaf L of class K. And it's of course also the case that if we take the sum over uh, all of these, over all of our possible Ks, this is equal to NL. It's also useful to be able to talk about the fraction of samples that belong to uh, class K in one leaf, and we're gonna write that as PLK. And uh, this is NLK over NL. Okay, and one, one other way to, uh, to write this Is, uh, is this way. So I'm going to take a sum over all the J's in leaf L, all of the J's in leaf L such that YJ is equal to class K. So the, the colon there means uh, such that. And, and, uh, and we're going to take that sum over, uh, uh, we're going to sum a bunch of ones where the number of them is uh, defined by uh, this expression here. That expression is exactly this number here, the NLK. This will this will be this step will be important just as it was with mean squared error here in a moment. In the denominator, we can express this as the sum of J in L sub L of a bunch of ones. So, so this term here is equal to NL. Okay, so, so now, now that we've introduced our uh, terminology here, our notation, um, uh, what I'd like to do is talk about genie impurity. And what we derived last time um, uh, essentially looks like this. I didn't use the L as a, a subscript here. We were generally just talking about individual leaves, um, but uh, now, uh, uh, now I'm going to be very explicit about uh, the, the fact that we're talking about leaf L. And uh, this is defined as one minus uh, the sum of uh, over K of P L comma K squared. And, and if you go back a few videos, you can see that uh, derivation there. And this is, this is for leaf L, that's an E right there. Gini impurity for the full tree is just a weighted sum over all of the Gini impurities for the individual leaves. We did not derive this, but, uh, but it certainly is uh, related to uh, other things that we have uh, talked about. So this is a sum uh, over all of our leaves uh, and it's weighted by the number of elements that have fallen down into uh, leaf L of our GL that we just defined. And in the uh, denominator, we're just taking a sum of all of the elements in the, uh, in the uh, uh, leaf nodes. Of course, this reduces down to big M, which is our number of, say, data set elements. Okay, so, so this is uh, the, our Gini impurity uh, defined in the equal weighting uh, case. And 
uh, and now what I want to do is uh, is talk about it in terms of uh, in, in terms of the weighted uh, sample case. So let's let's back up here. So so uh, right in here we define this PLK uh, as in particular this ratio here. And when we shift over to the, the weighted case, then the, the equivalent, uh, the equivalent uh, expression is uh, PLK is our sum, again, over the j's in the leaf uh, L, uh, such that yj is equal to k. And instead of having a one in the sum, this now becomes our wj. And the same for our denominator here. So this is the sum over all the j's in our leaf and a wj right there. Now if all of our w's are equ equal to one another, and in, in particular it's easy to see if all of our w's are one, then we reduce down to uh, this ratio here. But it, it turns out if, if all the w's are equal to each other, you still end up with that ratio. So this is, the uh, really the only thing that changes as far as our notion of Gini uh, impurity. Now, when we go to compute Gini impurity for uh, for our individual leaf nodes, instead of using this PK up here, we're using this PK um, here, and then uh, Gini impurity for the full tree still gets uh, all of our new uh, GLs. So, so this is the only thing that that changes. Uh, in uh, our uh, genie-based decision tree learning algorithm. So what this means is that when we're considering a split, uh, in, in the original scenario, uh, we, it mattered to us, say for the two class case, that we try to separate the positive uh, elements from the negative elements as best as possible. And, and now with this uh, weighted algorithm, we really only care about the samples that have interesting weights. If we have some samples that have very low weights, then the uh, decision tree algorithm is not going to be punished if it doesn't split the, the positive negatives that have a very low weight. It only cares about the, the higher weight uh, positive and negative samples. Okay, so, so that's our modification to the decision tree learning algorithm. And now it's time to talk about the AdaBoost algorithm. So this is uh, AdaBoost, and we're just going to do an outline of uh, this algorithm. So, so the very first thing we, we do before we have learned any trees, there's an initialization phase uh, where for every sample J, uh, we assign uh, WJ to be uh, equal to one over uh, M. So every training set sample uh, gets equal weight. And then from there, what we're going to do is loop uh, over the process of learning our different uh, elements of our ensemble. So we're going to uh, uh, learn tree T. And T here, this is my, my index uh, for uh, uh, a tree, sort of uh, trivial definition there. So we're going to learn tree T, uh, and in particular, we're going to use the weights that we've just computed. And, and, and by learn tree T, I just mean invoke our genie-based decision tree algorithm, except now we have the weighted genie metric. And then with uh, Respect to tree T, we're going to compute our predictions. And this is all, for all of our training set uh, elements. And, and this is just with respect to the, the last tree that we've just learned. And then for tree T, what we're going to do is compute and a measure of uh, how much error it's producing, in, in prediction error it's producing. We'll call this weighted error. And what the book does is it refers to this as R. And this is a measure over the entire tree. 
and the uh, this is a ratio of two sums. So the numerator is is uh, all of the j's for which the true label, the true class, does not equal to the uh, the predicted class, and it's going to be a sum over the wj's. And then the denominator is just our all of our j's. So if if our tree is making an error on uh, every training set sample, then uh, this ratio will be one. When this tree uh, is making no errors, then this set right here is the empty set. So so that sum is zero. So R T uh, equal to zero means uh, no errors, and that this is no prediction errors. And then a value somewhere in between is, uh, it means that we're making some number of errors. And of course, we're, we're not counting crisply, we're counting based on the weights. Um, we expect the outcome of the tree learning uh, algorithm. We expect that RT is uh, always less than uh, 0 0.5, meaning half the time, if we're doing crisp counting, half the time it should be getting correct answers. And, and we expect that from our training algorithm. All right, so then the next step is if we're going to ask the question of if RT is equal to zero, um, then we are done. So we escape from the, the, uh, the loop, we're done training our trees. This is what we have as a perfect tree. Um, Otherwise, we're going to, uh, what we're going to do is go about uh, making adjustments to our weights and setting up to, to learn the next tree. So we're going to compute the tree weight, and uh, the book calls this alpha t, and it's set to, this is just a, a training parameter, eta, and this is log one minus RT over RT. Uh, so when RT is uh, equal to 0.5, and we said that it, actually it should be less than 0.5, uh, alpha T is equal to zero. When uh, as RT uh, approaches zero, then alpha T approaches uh, infinity. Approaches that slowly, but it does approach it. Okay, and then uh, and then we compute uh, new uh, instance weights, and we're going to do this uh, in two steps, or I guess I should say new sample weights. So the first step is uh, we're going to set WJ to one of two different values depending upon what's going on. We're either going to get WJ back uh, if we made the correct prediction, if our our last tree made the correct prediction. And otherwise, we're going to set, set it to wj uh, multiplied by uh, 1 minus rt over rt. And this is the case uh, if uh, w, uh, yj does not equal to yj hat. So for, for rt that is uh, close to uh, 0 0.5 or is at 0 0.5, then this ratio is uh, is equal to one, and and what that means is that uh, W J doesn't change at all. But for uh, uh, for small uh, R Ts, then this is going to be a, a large number, a large value, and uh, and one way to think about that large number is that. Uh, since it's being multiplied by WJ, we're boosting the value of WJ uh, upwards. So, so this is this is the boost case here, and this is the no boost case. 
Okay, so that's that's the first step with our WJs, and then finally there's a normalization step where where we just ensure that the sum of the WJs uh, is equal to is equal to one. So there we go. And uh, and then from there, let's back up a little bit. From from there, then we return back up to our loop and we learn the next tree. So if we have a, a scenario where we've boosted some of our samples, then uh, WJ, their WJ has gotten bigger through this step here, um, through, through this step here. Uh, and the remaining samples, if we're uh, e either, uh, if we're getting those correct, then we're in this case here where WJ hasn't changed. But then once we uh, do this normalization step, what happens is that the WJs for the ones that didn't change actually goes down, and uh, and then these uh, end up being these cases here end up being relatively uh, larger than uh, they were in the last step. So the the summary here is that our uh, we're going to learn a tree given a set of weights. So so we're using this weighted Gini metric. And then we're going to walk through all of our training set samples. And uh, for those that are, uh, that we get correct with this uh, tree, the predictions that we get correct for this tree, the WJs generally are going to be going down as a result of that combination of, uh, that combination of uh, steps here. And for the ones that our tree is getting wrong, relatively those Ws are going to go up. So the next tree that we end up learning is, is going to focus more on those particular training set elements that, that uh, our, our tree is, is getting wrong. And, and so in this way, our algorithm over time is going to end up covering different parts of our, uh, of our training set, um, such that in the end, we end up with an ensemble that, uh, that, that does a good job across all of our training sets. All right, the, the last step here is I want to talk about what the prediction is that comes out of our entire ensemble. So uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, define that. So y hat uh, uh, ensemble here for some feature vector x. I'm gonna, I'm gonna abuse the notation just a little bit here. Um, what we're going to do is uh, predict uh, the class that has the highest score. So, so we're going to uh, we're going to predict the k that has the highest uh, score, which is it's the sum over all of our alpha t's, um, where uh, it's it's uh, all of our trees and on are in our ensemble such that the prediction that's made by Tr uh, tree uh, t on this new query point is equal to uh, class k. So, so the way that we end up evaluating this is uh, we find all of the, the trees that uh, predict class zero, and we sum up their alphas, and then we then we find all of the trees that uh, predict uh, class one, we sum up their alphas, uh, et cetera, and then we pick the the one that gives us that the the largest sum. That's what this arg max uh, gives us. Um, so, in this particular algorithm, this Ada boost algorithm, the trees don't even get to vote with equal weight. They actually uh, vote with different weights depending upon what their alpha is. Okay, so that's that's the uh, summary of the Ada Boost uh, algorithm for classification, and now it's time to uh, try a little bit of code.